my grandfather taught me how to weld when I was four years old. And it was an experience that was at once both exhilarating, it was fun, but it was also terrifying. See, when we look through the glass, the world's seen through the glass darkly, and the whole world looks almost completely black except a tiny little speck of really bright white light. And I thought, there must be a better way. So this is what led me to invent HDR, High Dynamic Range Image. <laughs> <laughs> I should do some high dynamic range audio too. <laughs> and so we see the world, this, this technology is now used in, in many commercially made cameras, including the Apple iPhone. But more importantly, it perhaps was the first time in human history that a person was able to see the welding process. From the tip of the tungsten electrode there, for example, or all the way up into the deep, darkest shadows a dynamic range of more than 100 million to one. And I felt that being able to see better was a basic human need. I spent much of my childhood as an amateur scientist, inventor, tinkering, creating, and exploring the world of digital eyeglass. Fast forward a little bit. 10 years later, at MIT, I was accepted into MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. This was 21 years ago. Here's a documentary with the director, Nicholas Negroponte, describing how I brought this invention down to MIT and founded the MIT Wearable Computing Project, becoming its first member. It's a very, very different time for us. Steve Mann was uh, building wearable computers in high school. And I think it's, it's perfectly good example that here's a young man that brought with him an idea that was very much on the lunatic fringe it was very much something that people thought, well this is kind of weird and it doesn't really make sense and when he arrived here a lot of people sort of said wow this is very interesting and faculty became more interested and he and it's a i think it's probably one of the best examples we have of where somebody brought with them an extraordinarily interesting seed. And then it sort of, you know, it grew. And there are many people now, so-called cyborgs in the media lab and uh, people working on wearable computers all over the place. So what seemed like a crazy idea became something that lots of people were interested in seeing. Now, this is another thing I invented, which was a necklace with a camera and a projector built into the necklace so that it would project onto the real world and project images and and text and things onto the, onto the world in front of me so I could do augmented reality. I called it synthetic synesthesia of the sixth sense. <laughs> and if that's too much of a mouthful, you can just call it sixth sense. 16 years ago, I created Sixth Sense, but now I'm working on Seventh Sense, which we call space glasses. As chief scientist of MetaView, makers of space glasses, I'm working with my PhD student, Raymond Lowe, who is the chief technology officer of space glasses. And here is our product. Many inventions come from research labs, but wearable computing, digital eyeglasses, and HDR are inventions that came from my everyday life, 
And in that sense, these are technologies that are very much in and of the real world, not just a research lab. So I was very ins much inspired by the IEEE, the world's largest technical society. I even, uh, I was general chair of the IEEE ISTAS, an IEEE conference. And we believe in advancing technology for humanity. So when I saw people hunched over these key punch machines back in the 1970s, bent over these things like pretzels, people twisted around the computer, I thought, well, instead of twisting ourselves around this key punch machine, we should twist the computer around ourselves. And so that's why I spent the last 35 years inventing, designing, building, and wearing computers. But when I did so, I uncovered some many strange paradoxes about society. Back in the 70s, people used to cross the street to avoid me. But by the early 1980s, I started building these into eyeglasses. It's funny, simply moving it from helmets to eyeglasses. Then suddenly people came running across the street, running towards me and saying, oh, what's that? That's really cool. I want to get one of those. People loved it as in its eyeglass form factor, except for certain people. And it's not just me anymore. You see, 35 years ago, it was just me but now I think there's lots of people wearing cameras. Recently, a travel agent from Idaho was physically assaulted in McDonald's for photographing the menu. Now I thought, that's a strange paradox. What are the privacy rights of a menu? What is it that's so secret about a menu, or signage in general? Because many people use smartphone apps to translate signs into a different language using optical character recognition, or they simply use a camera to magnify text that's too small to read. Here's some QR codes. A QR code is a sign in the lower right corner there that means cameras are required. It's a sign that says, take out your camera and point your camera at me. And yet, we see these signs, QR codes, right beside other signs that say, no camera, no video, no cell phones, no cell phone in store, please, no video or photo taking. At the US consulate, when I was picking up my daughter's passport, I was both required to enter to get it, but also forbidden from entering. You see, electronic devices are not allowed in the US consulate, but I am an electronic device. You know, by my mere existence, I'm existential contraband. <laughs> so I would go in there, and I would see there's all these cameras, you know, in any of these government buildings or businesses or department stores where cameras are forbidden, they say no cameras, but I walk in and say, oh, there's a camera over there, there's another one over there, there's another one over there, and they say, oh, but those are surveillance cameras, those are not cameras. So then I said, well, I guess my seeing aid is not allowed, um, but what if I put a transmitter on my camera and transmit the video to the police station and I work together with the police so that they can use my glass to find suspects. They can see out through my glass and track down suspects. Then my seeing aid would become a surveillance camera and that would make it no longer be a camera. So I looked at the definition of surveillance. <laughs> surveillance comes from two parts, the sur part and the valence part. Sur means from above or over, as in surtax or surcharge. And valence means watching, from the French word vele, which means to watch. Surveillance is a watch kept over someone or something, especially over a suspect or prisoner. For example, the suspects were under police surveillance. If you don't like French, the closest English word is oversight. My six-year-old made this nice little drawing. <laughs> surveillance and surveillance. Surveillance is the opposite of surveillance, as in sous chef. And my kids asked me, my daughter 
in the audience here and my, and, the, and my younger daughter who drew this drawing asked me, they said, Daddy, why is it that buildings have more rights than people? Why is it that buildings are allowed to wear cameras but people are not? Why is it that cars are allowed to wear cameras? You see, you can have a dash cam, a dashboard camera in your car, and you can drive into a movie theater. <clears throat> a theater owner would never say, oh, your car's not allowed to wear a camera in this movie theater. <laughs> Why is it that merchandise is more important than people? Why must we protect the welfare of candy on a department store shelf with cameras, but why can't people have cameras to protect themselves and their own bodies? Less than half a year ago, New York police planted crack in a shop in New York. They recorded the process of finding the crack. You see, they record the police have cameras, and they planted the crack, and then they found the crack, and they recorded the part where they found the crack, but they selectively omitted the part where they planted the crack. But the shopkeeper had his own surveillance cameras that recorded everything, <coughs> including the part where the police planted the crack. So when the shopkeeper was arrested, this more complete recording was presented <coughs> and used to gain his release. Now imagine if, that, imagine if the police had planted the crack in his backpack while he was walking down the street instead of in his shop, making his backpack into a crack pack. <laughs> now, in Singapore, drug possession is a hanging offense. So if the police didn't like someone in Singapore, they could just crack pack them <laughs> and then take them to the gallows and hang them. Shouldn't a person be able to protect their own body the same as they would a store? In other words, I've often, in my book, I describe clothing as a building for a single occupant. And since a building is allowed to wear cameras, if we regard clothing as a building for one person, then clothing should be allowed to wear cameras too. And so I refer to clothing as an architecture of one or an architecture for one. Recently in McDonald's, also in Paris, France, I was physically assaulted by McDonald's staff because I am a camera. And this was a very prominent McDonald's on the Champs-Élysées in a main through fair of Paris, France. And they had lots of security and lots of cameras. And I asked them, I said, would you please look at your surveillance cameras to, to study what happens? And they said, okay, we'll investigate. But they refused to look at their surveillance video. They wanted to go entirely and only on employee testimony and nothing else. So it's very interesting how people save and look at surveillance video when it suits their needs, but if it doesn't suit their needs, they either lose it or ignore it or it gets deleted or something like that. So I've got a lot thinking a lot about surveillance. Surveillance says we can watch and record you, but you're not allowed to watch or record us. In this sense, surveillance is the valence of hypocrisy. The opposite of surveillance is surveillance. You see there's two kinds of valence. And surveillance is the valence of what? What is the opposite of hypocrisy? The opposite of hypocrisy is integrity, thus making surveillance the valence of integrity. At TNT supermarket here in Toronto, they told me I was not allowed to use a seeing aid. You see, my glass can focus very close, up to an inch or even down to a centimeter, and I can hold something up to my eye, a small label on ingredients, and read it. But they said, of course, that I wasn't allowed to do that. Sixth sense synthetic synesthesia of the sixth sense, <laughs> has never been a problem in any of these establishments. In other words, if I have the camera hang down hanging around my neck, it's never been any sort of problem. Even if I have my iPhone dangling down like this and recording everything, it's never a problem. Only when it's up over the eye to help us see better, then it becomes a problem. So in some sense, I even wore this to a few different gambling casinos hanging around my neck. None of them said anything about it. <laughs> now, I thought of these different ideas. I said, okay, well, we could go to human rights law, we can go to liabilization, but I thought of another idea worth spreading. And that is an idea I want to call the valence contract. It's an integrity protocol for the cyborg age. It's very simple. Let me give you an analogy. Suppose that Al, the owner of Acme Corporation, invites you over to his office to sign a contract. 
and you come over to his office, and it's 100 pages long, and your signatures are on the very last page. Page 100 is the signature page. You look at this contract, and Acme has a no photography, no copying, no recording, no note-taking policy. After all, I've even been told in some department stores that I'm not allowed to take notes or write anything down. So Acme invites you in, and you say, okay, I disagree with what's on page five. And Al says, all right, I'll type up a new page five and print it out for you and put it into the contract. That's good. Okay, do you like that? Uh, still a couple of things. Okay, let's try again. Finally, here's a version of page five that you're happy with. So good. Now, there's something on page 10 you don't understand. He says, bring your legal counsel. That's fine. And as long as your legal counsel also agrees to no copying, no note taking, no photography, good. Page 10, don't like it, we'll change it. Okay, that's good. Now you agree to all the things in the contract. And so you both sign page 100, you and Al. And you go on your way and you leave and Al has the only copy of the contract. Now, a week later, Al comes in with a gallon of whiskey in a big jug. And he comes in half drunk. And he staggers over and he knocks the table over and it falls to the floor. And all the papers go scattered everywhere. And then he's going around and he picks it up and he says, oh, I see three copies of page five. I wonder which one, I don't forget which one it was. I think it was that one. Let me shred the other two. Page 10, I'm not sure. I think I'll take that one and shred the other one. And then he puts it in his safe. And two years later, he sues you for contract infringement. Now, eventually you'll get a copy of the contract in court through a process called discovery. But that might be three years later. And by then, you look at it and you say, it doesn't look like what I remembered signing. Well, what I want to say here with the valence contract is that when A makes a recording of something and forbids B from doing so, that B should not be able to use that recording as evidence in court. In other words, Al should not be able to use his contract in court against B because he didn't allow B to have a copy. Otherwise, we invite corruption, we invite careless errors, and in this sense, also TNT, supermarket, if they want to prosecute someone for shoplifting, they should not be able to use their recordings in court if they forbid the person from having their own recording that might exonerate themselves. Otherwise, they could do the same thing that the police in New York did and just selectively omit certain parts and show only certain parts of their video. And so the integrity is very important. So for you libertarians out there who say, well, I don't want to have to obey human rights law. It's my shop, and I can say no eyeglasses allowed in my shop, no wheelchairs allowed in my shop, whatever it is. You might say I don't want to comply with human rights. I'm, I want laissez-faire sort of government hands-off. Well, then we'll give you exactly what you want. But So when you accuse someone of shoplifting, don't come crying to us and wanting to use our courtrooms and our jails to process shoplift suspects if you've forbidden them from keeping their own copy of what happened. So surveillance is the valence of centralized data repository. It's the valence where one entity is a custodian of the data, whereas surveillance is distributed, where multiple entities are the custodians of the data. Now, surveillance cameras used to look like this. So surveillance, surveillance might have looked like this back in the day. <laughs> this, is, this is an artist's rendition. But we all know that's an old-fashioned surveillance camera. Nowadays, surveillance cameras are shrouded in mysterious domes of wine-dark opacity so that we can't see which way the camera's looking. They're designed this way so that governments and industries can hide cameras in there, any number of cameras, and we don't see how many cameras there are or where they're aimed. I want to say on the upper left that since surveillance is the valence of secrecy, why don't we make surveillance be the valence of openness? Surveillance is also the valence of data integrity. Because of its distributed nature, if I broadcast something on YouTube, and then I go and edit it and falsify it later, I'm going to get caught. So there's a, 
a vulnerability we have when we make our data available to others and be open about it. Openness shares a vulnerability, which is kind of like a checksum on errors, and it kind of gives us data integrity. What's the opposite of data integrity? It's data corruption. So if surveillance is the valence of data integrity, then surveillance is the valence of data corruption. Or more generally, surveillance is the valence of corruption. It's kind of a, the word corruption is a double entendre. It could mean data corruption, police corruption, government corruption, or whatever it might be. Let's go to an example. Eight years ago, back in 2005, a Brazilian electrician was shot dead on the London Underground subway. Police had the wrong guy, though. They thought it was somebody else, and they shot him dead. They thought he was a terrorist, but it turned out he was just an electrician. And so after they shot him dead, there were four surveillance camera recordings made of that space. Four independent systems recorded that incident. And the police seized all four hard drives from these four different systems and said they were blank. But some of the people who worked in the London Underground had looked at some of those surveillance recordings before the police seized them and had noticed that there was content on them. So this created quite a stir. This was eight years ago. Now today, I want to look at a contrasting example. I live on Dundas Street West, and every day the Dundas streetcar goes past my house. Less than two months ago, a tragic incident happened on that streetcar with a teenager named Sammy Yatim. Police arrived to find the boy alone on the streetcar. The streetcar had come to a stop. He was alone with a knife on the streetcar. Everybody else had gotten off, including the driver, and the streetcar doors were open, and he's standing in the streetcar with a knife. He was surrounded by police, and the police had their guns drawn, and they said, one of, and they were a safe distance away from him. They were in no way in danger. And one of the officers said, put down the knife. <clears throat> now, the boy froze, perhaps in terror. You know, if somebody was pointing a gun at you, you might be scared, and he just froze there, and he didn't move. And so the officer shot him three times. After he fell to the ground, the officer shot the boy another six times. Now, what happened there was different than what happened in the London Underground. In the London Underground, the officers were acquitted, no charges. Here, the officer was charged with murder. An important difference here is that there was surveillance. Now, there are four cameras on that streetcar. I actually had photographed those same cameras, because I like photographing surveillance cameras for research papers. And it's, it's funny, it's ironic, but I had photographed the same cameras on that same 505 streetcar before Sammy was shot, and I counted them, there's four of them, because I do that, I count surveillance cameras. And if those were the only recordings, maybe, who knows what would have happened, the police might have seized them. Now, if the police were wearing cameras, it wouldn't have made much of a difference either. But because some other people were carrying cameras and happened to record this and post it, it created a public inquiry. So surveillance, by its open nature, and by its crowdsourcing, this is another drawing from my six-year-old, created a situation that brought this matter to the attention of the public. While opposed by some, surveillance may actually provide the other side of a balanced valence, completing the other half of the valence contract the implicit ad item contract that we all live our lives by. Thank you. <laughs>